left, hallelujah. Open your Bibles to um, John chapter 16, verse 7. John chapter 16, verse 7. And I'm going to minister to you tonight the plan of the Holy Spirit. And it'll take a little bit different twist than I think that you're prepared for, but uh, I want to start here in John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus is talking. It is profitable or expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. The Comforter meaning the Holy Spirit. He calls him the Comforter. The paraclete is the term in the Greek. It means to comfort. He will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Everybody say sin, sin. Righteousness, righteousness, and of judgment. I'm having you repeat it just to make sure you read it with me. Look at verse 9. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Verse 10. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Verse 11. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Now here, outlined in this portion passage of Scripture, is the plan of the Holy Spirit's work. Jesus said, here's what he will come to do. He'll convict the world of sin, righteousness, of judgment. What did he mean by that? He explains it. Of sin because they believe not on me. It's the only sin that, that he's come to convince people of because they believe not on him. Secondly, of righteousness because I go to the Father. Thirdly, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. This is the plan of God through the work of the Holy Spirit, which is His plan. To overcome sin, the cross is what defeats it. To make you righteous, the blood is what does that for you. And to give you authority over the devil, the prince of this world is judged. To give you and I authority over the devil, the resurrection makes that possible. No resurrection, no defeat of hell. Jesus Christ completely defeated hell when he raised from the dead. Now, the Bible says in Psalm 139, verse 16, which you're familiar with because we use it a lot in talking about uh, how we were created and how God created us. But it's interesting how it says it. Verse 16 says that God wrote his plan for you in a book. Not only does he tell us the plan of God in the work of the earth or the plan of the Holy Spirit, he also tells us that the plan that God has for you is actually written in a book. Listen to it. You saw me before I was born. You scheduled each day of my life before I began to breathe. Every day was recorded in your book. God has a plan for your life. The Holy Spirit knew exactly what His work and plan was to do in the earth. Convict people of one sin that they did not believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Every other sin is an outcrop from that. Every one. The Bible says to convict you of righteousness, that God has come by His own blood to make you right with God. The Holy Spirit convinces or convicts you of that. And thirdly, that Satan has been defeated, that he has been judged. You know, when God first created man... He told him what that plan and purpose was for man. And the scripture says in 1 Psalm 39 that even now he has a blueprint, a book written about the plan of your life. Wouldn't you like to read it? <laughs> he has a plan for your life. The Bible says in Genesis that God had planned favor for you. He blessed man. The scripture says that he had planned fruitfulness for you. He commanded man to be fruitful to produce or reproduce. He also planned for man to multiply or to replenish, which was to increase beyond your own need, to increase beyond your own supply. God wanted you to multiply. It was his plan. And then he planned for you to rule. He gave you dominion, dominion over all the creatures of the earth. And they had this was God's plan for man. And so he explained it to him. Here's what I created you for. Here's my plan for you. And then they didn't listen to God's plan. They decided they wanted to make their own plan. 
And when they made their own plan, it destroyed them. It destroyed their family. It destroyed their favor. It destroyed their fruitfulness, their productivity. It destroyed their increase. It destroyed their dominion. Sadly, when you and I make our plans that aren't according to God's plan, and we do it separate from Him, the Bible says that God cannot bless your plans. I watch people do it all the time, try and make their own plans and say, oh Lord, bless this, favor me with it, make it productive, cause me to multiply and increase. This is my plan, God. I know it must be from you, but we make it ourselves. Just like the disciples we see them start to make their own plans and they're walking with Jesus. Did you ever think about it? Matthew 16, we just heard about it and uh, Bob Vanderplotz and his message to us on Sunday when he was referencing this passage of Scripture. But Jesus is basically laying out his plan that God has planned for him. And he says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things of, of the chief elders, the priests, the scribes. And I will suffer and die there. And I will be raised from the dead on the third day. Remember how Peter got his plan, his foot in his mouth? But it was his plan. He said, oh, no, Lord, this is not, you shouldn't even think like this. This is a bad plan. He said, this is a wrong kind of plan, and he rebuked Christ for it. And you remember, Jesus rebukes Satan, and after he rebukes Satan, then he turned to Peter and said, Peter, you are savoring the plans of man and not the plan of God. In other words, you, you haven't read the plan that's been written for you, Peter. God is a plan for you. And this is the plan of God that I should come and die for you. So you, you're trying to mess up God's plan by having your own plan. And Peter had a justification right for the plan that he had. He, he's like, this is a good plan, Jesus. You're going to rule over Rome. You're, you're about to take the throne. This is, this is the plan that you must have. Don't, don't think in terms of your plan. Think in terms of my plan. <laughs> this is not the only time he did this. You remember when, when Jesus went to worship every, all the disciples' feet? Peter, again, had a different plan. He said, oh, no, Lord, no, 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 no. In other words, he thought it was beneath him. You are too high and mighty. You're, you're the master, the Messiah. You don't wash other people's feet. That's what servants do. You don't do that, Jesus said. Peter, you're missing the whole plan of God. Are you and I savoring the plans of men? rather than savoring the plans of God? Oh, it's not the only time. Don't you remember James and John? They had some plans going on. They saw Jesus and his rule and his power. They said, you know what? We would like to be a set at your right hand when you come into your throne. You know, so we, one on the one left, one on the right. In fact, their mother got in on it with them. You remember that? She came and she approached Jesus about having her boys sit. Jesus said, you know what? That's not mine to give. It's not mine to give. There had been a plan written for them, and they were endeavoring to make their own plan. Judas did the same. Judas did the same. When, you remember when the woman came with the, with the uh, oil barrel? Oil barrel. The oil of the, the container, and she poured it all out on Jesus' feet. It was very expensive perfume. I shouldn't say oil perfume. And you remember how Judas stood up and he said, Hey, that's a, that's a lot of waste. You, 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 you could have sold that and we could have given it to the poor. That sounds so righteous, doesn't it? So holy. But only man's plans would consider what God does as wasteful. Hmm? God never wastes. Even when he abundantly poured out food in such supply that there were 12 baskets left over, notice that there were 12 baskets. There was no waste. They picked up all the extra, the, the enormous abundance. There wasn't any waste. God said, she didn't waste it. She's preparing me for burial. It's the most precious gift she should have given me. And then he revealed that Judas had an attitude where he wasn't concerned about the poor. He didn't want to sell it and give it to the poor. He was taking money out of the treasury. He was stealing from the checkbook. The last thing he wanted was to give to the poor. He wanted it to be sold so there was a little more in there so no one would notice when he took some more. Man's plans. How often have we followed our own plans instead of God's? James reminds us the danger of following our own plans. 
because he says it corrupts our life. It becomes deadly to our lives. And it leads to our own frustration and to dead ends in our life. Listen to it, James 4.13. You say, today or tomorrow, we're going to go into such and such city, and we'll continue there a year, and we'll buy and sell, and we'll get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It's like a vapor that appears for just a little while, and then it fades away or vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live. And we'll do this or that. But now you rejoice in your own boastings. And all such rejoicing is evil. How many times have we created evil around us by making our own plans without God? Notice in this verse of Scripture that God's not against planning. He didn't say planning was wrong or that planning was evil. He calls it evil if you're making plans apart from his will, apart from his plan. Just as the Tower of Babel was a plan of man, but it was apart from the will of God. It wasn't what God had called them to do, but they all unified around. It was a good plan. It was a justified plan. It was our plan. And what was that plan about? Well, we're going to build a tower we're going to bring safety to ourselves. We're going to make a name for ourselves. We're just going to reach up into the heavens and we'll all be gathered together instead of spread out all over the earth and, and, and rule over the earth like God has told us. No, we, we have our own plan, God. We think that yours is a bad idea. And they begin to build that tower. And it brought confusion to them. It brought destruction to them. And it literally was idolatry. Making our own plans and asking God to bless it is asking God to bless your own idolatry because you are making your own plan. When you plan without God, it's idolatry. You're worshiping your ideas, your goals. You can worship your plans and you can even try and make it sound holy. I watch people do it all the time. Well, I'm praying God will help me do it. I'm asking Him to bless it. But is it His or is it yours? Isaiah describes this well. He says, People worship me with their mouths and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are from, or far from me. For their worship is based on human plans. Well, there is an emphasis today on personal growth. We call it self-help material, but it's everywhere. and It's been around for a while and it's, and it's strong. It's probably the number one selling books other than romance novels. Romance novels are number one. And then personal growth help books are, are next in line. And we see how to grow your business or how to grow personally or, or how to grow your ministry or how to grow your church. And, and we got all of these growth books and there's such a, and they have plans in them. This is how you grow yourself. And you have to have a personal growth plan. And I'm not even saying that they're evil or wrong unless, unless you separate them from God. This is what I want to accomplish. This is what I want to grow to be. This is what I want to do. And I'm going to make a plan to get it. Lord, bless me and help me. Help me make this plan in my life. It's not that growth is bad or wrong. In fact, God's wills for your growth. He wills for your own personal growth and desires for you to grow. But it is easy in our life to slide into pushing God out and making our plans without him, and then coming back and asking him to make that plan come true. It's worshiping growth for the sake of growth. Like the people of the Tower of Babel, we'll make a name for ourselves. Look how I've grown. Look how my business has grown. Look at how I've achieved. Look at how strong I am. Look at how many finances I've grown. Whatever the growth part is, we become concerned about our growth. And so we find ways to market it. We find ways to plan for it. We begin to focus on it. Whether we realize it or not, we're worshiping it and asking God to bless it. It tells us that we're succeeding if we grow in numbers or grow in finances, that somehow we have a greater influence or that we're making a name unto ourselves. And we're asking God to bless it. When we make our plans based on human affection, it is always, 
always founded in our own pride. Our own pride in our own success, our own pride in our self-made man or self-made woman, or look at my own efforts or how hard I've worked, I've made it on my own, I've done it my way. Or pride in our financial growth, look what I've accumulated, look how much I own. When we make our plans, our purpose becomes wrong. When we make our plans without God, our purpose is always corrupt. It's almost always the reason for every church split and every division that happens within the body of believers. Pride gets in the way. We want to achieve certain things. Others don't want to achieve it. Then doubt begins to arise. Or what about even when the largest church body that existed was the nation of Israel? They were actually the beginnings of church, God's people, a holy people called to Him. And He calls three million of them out of Egypt. And when they get out of Egypt, you remember His plan first to deliver them out of Egypt and then to take them into the land of promise. It become known as the promised land. It was the land that God had promised to Abraham. And He says, not only do I want to take you there, I promise it to Abraham and to his heirs, his children and his children's children, and now I'm giving it to you. That was his plan. But then doubt arose. You remember how it rose? It forced because of major obstacles that were in the way of God's plan. And it makes them question the plan of God, like every human being does when they discover God's plan. It's too big for me to accomplish alone. It's crazy. It puts me too much at risk. I could never do it. I don't know enough people. I don't have the education. What are you thinking, God? It can't be possible. And then we reverse on God's plan and we get into doubt. It can't be God. It's too dangerous. It's too much and I'm too afraid. And so they doubt God's plan and they do so because of their own need for safety and their own convenience. This will require a sacrifice I'm not ready to make. Besides that, I might be killed and leave my children alone. And so they started making their own plans. You remember? Build us a golden calf. When Moses had disappeared, let's go back to Egypt. Or after Moses had come back and disciplined them for refusing to follow God, then they get ready to go into the promised land and they say, oh my gosh, are you nuts, Moses? This cannot be God. There's giants in the land. And the, and the, and the walls are too strong around the cities. It's an impossibility. But this was God's plan. Do you know it is God's plan to favor you? It is God's plan to increase you? It is God's plan to prosper you? It is God's plan to give you a good end and a hope and a future. When you make your own plans leaving God out, you'll never experience the fullness of His plan or His plan for you. One of the things that's the mission of our church is to encourage people to find their lives in Jesus Christ. Why? It's the beginning of a whole new plan. It's God's plan for you. In fact, He planned for everyone to be saved, even though not everyone will be. It's His will and purpose for all men to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and have faith in Him. So our first mission is a biggie. Encourage people to find their lives in Jesus Christ. It's God's plan for him. It's God's plan for me. But when we begin to make our own plans, leaving God out, we never experience the fullness of his plan for us. In fact, we grieve him. We limit him. Psalm 90, 78, verse 41 says, about the nation of Israel, the big church, that they provoked God in the wilderness and they grieved him and they tempted him and they limited the Holy One of Israel. Can we limit God's plans for us? We sure can. <laughs> Even tempt Him. Provoke Him. Our plans limit God. They provoke and tempt Him when we make our plans without Him. No wonder the psalmist revealed, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Well, we'll make our own plans to protect this city. We'll keep watchmen up there 24-7. We'll have cameras on every section. That's our plan. We're not going to be stupid and foolish. But is the Lord protecting you? Are you making a plan without Him? 
Sometimes we live our lives in fear because of what's going on around us and all the protections that we need and all the resources that we got to have in case something goes out or the grid goes down and all this government, you know, stuff that's happening. And we're trying to think, oh my, and, and are we living in fear or are we trusting God? What plans are we making? Are we making them apart from God? No wonder the psalmist revealed, except the Lord build the house. You labor in vain that build it. He didn't say it didn't even get built. He just said it was vain. You know what the word vain means? Useless, pointless, worthless, to no purpose. <laughs> Wouldn't it be a bummer to live all your life without fulfilling the plan of God to no purpose, useless, worthless? Like the rich man in Luke 6 who's clothed in fine linen every day and, and fares sumptuously every day, the Bible says. Every day. And then he dies. And now the scripture says he's in hell and lifts up his eyes and is tormented in hell. So many plans he'd made. All without God. Plans that he had even accomplished. He'd built some houses. But he'd done it in vain. What was the point? It was useless for him. It was pointless, to no purpose, vain. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 about this idea of God's plans concerning His reward. It teaches us about planning anything apart from Jesus Christ. It tells us He's the foundation stone for building or planning anything. For no other foundation can a man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, if any man builds upon this foundation gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, every man's plan, his work, will be known. For the day will declare it, the day of judgment. It is because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will try all of our works and what sort of is. Well, you know what fire does to gold, silver, and precious stones. It purifies them. But you know what fire does to wood, hay, and stubble? <laughs> Burns it up. It's pointless. It's useless. It's vain. The Bible tells us don't make plans on any other foundation than Jesus Christ. Make your plans with Him. If any man builds upon this foundation, so if we're building, we better not do it without the Lord because unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain to build it. The plans we make, wood, hay, and stubble, are burned up, useless, vain, to no purpose. But God's plans are gold, silver, and precious stones, and there's reward with that. God is loving enough to remind us, make plans with me. The plans that I have for you are good. They're plans to prosper you, not to harm you. They're plans to give you a hope and a future. I am positive that John 10.10, 10, in dealing with the very plans of God, Jesus is speaking to us that there is a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And what is he coming to steal, kill, and destroy? I believe without question it's the plan of God for your life. To get you off track, off center. To get you focused on your own flesh, your own desire, your own will. Sometimes it even looks good, like Peter. No, Lord, this is a bad idea. We should have a different plan, and we argue with the Lord about it. Even when He's speaking to us about His plan for our lives. Or like Israel, we say, you know, that's too hard, God. Or it seems too risky, or I might lose too much, and I'm scared about going into the land of promise that you've given me to give me a hope and a future. Let me make my own plans about this. The wilderness is looking better all the time. And we find ourselves in doubt against God. I think Satan comes to steal God's plans for our life to keep us in the dark about them. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full, Jesus says, but Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy God's plan. You know when Peter confronted Jesus about God's plan, coming up with his own plan about it, Jesus rebuked Satan. I rebuke you, Satan, he said. He understood that there was a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy God's plan in your life. And then he said to Peter, whom Satan had actually used unbeknowingly to Peter, he said, 
Peter, you're savoring the plans of man, not the plans of God. To keep you distracted, to keep you discouraged, even to keep you disappointed, even tempting you to follow man's plan. It's the work of hell against our life to hinder you and I from following God's plan. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and he said, we were taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart though. We endeavored the more abundantly to see your face and would have come to you, but Satan hindered us. They had become discouraged because they didn't have the word of the Lord brought by Paul. And so they had become disoriented. And Paul says, there's a reason that it happened. There was a demon, Satan, trying to hinder us from coming to you. God reveals that renewing our minds to God's word is a key component of discovering the plan of God for your life. Wow. Here's how you discover God's plan, by renewing your mind to his world. Do not be conformed to this world, but... Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect plan or will of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who's helping us reveal that plan to us so we know it, can follow it. That you may prove what is good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. David wrote, I love this, he wrote, may the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God my strength, my redeemer. You know what David's writing? May my thoughts be your plans and not my own. May I renew my mind and think the meditations of my own heart be acceptable to you. What would be acceptable to God to think, to meditate on? How you think will determine your plans. How you think will determine your plans. Meditation is thinking on something again and again and again to determine a choice, an action concerning what you're thinking on. If I think on God's words, I'm obviously thinking on His plans to determine choosing them. No wonder Isaiah writes, He who keeps his mind on me will be kept in perfect peace because we're thinking on the plans of God. How you think determines what you do and what you plan. No wonder Caleb and Joshua tried to convince the whole church body. What are you thinking? What are you thinking, they said, to their own countrymen. You're not choosing God's plan. You're choosing man's plan. You're not thinking on what God has said to us. They said, we should go up at once. For we are well able to possess this land and overcome Because of what God has said. If he delights in us, then he will bring us into this land that flows with milk and honey. They said, don't rebel against the Lord or fear the people of this land. Man's plans are always rooted in fear. How to protect what we have. How to keep what we have. (laughs) Once we accomplish something, oh, we want to keep it. We're scared to lose it. Man's plans will always do that in relationships, in finance, in your work. Why did they choose this plan rather than plan to go back to Egypt like the rest of them were planning? We should go back. We've come too far. We're in danger. We should go back. They said, no, we shouldn't go back because God had said, send men into Canaan, which I have given to you, one from each tribe, And scout out that land. They had kept thinking about that. Caleb and Joshua, this is our land. God's given it to us. Everywhere they looked, they saw the fruit and the land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, they saw the walls. They saw the giants. But it really didn't matter to them because God had said, I've given you this land. And they said to the other ten leaders, don't be afraid. Their defense has actually departed from them. They are now bread for us, for the Lord is with us. Do you think like that in accomplishing God's plan? Those people were enjoying the plan of God and they were afraid of losing it. And so they started meditating on something else. Look at the problems we're under. Look at what's going on. They forgot to think about that God had said, this land is yours. This land is your land. 
And they begin to think about something else, and they meditated on it. You could tell they murmured all night long. So they were what we call worry warts, right? They'd figured out what could go wrong and what could, we, what could turn out the worst, and they got to thinking on that more than they thought about what God was saying. When Joshua and Caleb led the people, 40 years later, they were still meditating upon the same word. As God said to Joshua, every place the sole of your foot shall tread, I have given it to you. That's the second verse in the book of Joshua. He was still thinking about it. I have given it to you. He said, so be strong and courageous. Keep my words in your mouth and in your mind. Think upon them. Meditate upon them day and night. And then you will go and do them. And it will make your way prosperous. And you'll have good success. God's plan should be thought on every day. What plans am I thinking about? Am I thinking on God's plans every day? To do me good? To give me a hope and a future? For His plan to prosper me? And to give me good health? To obey my parents? And it will be a reward to me and I'll live long on the earth and well? Do I think about that? Am I meditating on that? What am I thinking on? God's plan should be thought on and thought about. The Bible said it's transforming. The way the Holy Spirit convinces us or convicts us of believing in Jesus, of knowing that we're right with God because of His blood, and that we have full dominion over the devil because he's been judged. The cross judged him. Because the word of God is like a two-edged sword. It convicts or convinces. It cuts away the thoughts and the plans of man from the works of our flesh. Whatever our plans are, they should be done in obedience to God and his word. And if they're not, they're the wrong plans whether it's ministry or it's education or it's farming or it's manufacturing or technology or finance or marriage or whatever the case may be are we making our plans with God or are we serving our plans hmm? are we serving position and status are we serving making a name for ourselves? are we serving staying safe because we're afraid of the future. Renewing our mind to God's Word is a powerful way to discover God's plan for your life. In fact, I'm just kind of going to give you an assignment. I'm going to give you an assignment when you go out tonight to say, this week, I'm going to think about all week, God wrote a plan for me before I took a breath. And so He has a plan for my life. Am I thinking about that? Is that what I'm involved in? Or am I a saw that wants to be a hammer and I keep dulling my blade because I'm using it all wrong because it's my plan? Jesus taught us actually to pray this way, to pray God's plan in our life. He said, pray that His kingdom come and reigns. Pray His will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. We see this example in Jesus as he prayed to God on many occasions. Actually, before he would do certain things, he prayed all night before he picked his 12 disciples. A whole night. The next day, he chose the 12. Or we see him pray as he, uh, before he goes down to Samaria. Remember how he goes down to Samaria and meets one woman by a well? Then he talks to her about the fact that, you know, the five husbands she has, uh, she's not married now and she's living with a fella and been married five times. And now uh, he says, I've come to, to tell you how you can worship in spirit and in truth in the true mountain of God. And she's like, never a man has talked to me like this. And she went to the town, to the, to the city where the well was the feeding and she brought the whole town back out to Jesus and he ministered every one of them. He prayed all night before he went to Samaria. Here's what he said, I must needs go to Samaria. And his disciples were like, you know, that's, that's not a really good idea. Samaritans are, you know, they're kind of the dung of the earth, Jesus. We don't really, there's a better path. We can head up to Galilee. Let's not go through Samaria. And then, God forbid, he's talking to a woman, a Samaritan woman. 
I mean, you can't talk to any lower. Jesus, what are you thinking? This is not a good plan. But he had prayed all night and came, came to them in the morning and said, I must needs go to Samaria. <laughs> are you praying about God's plans? Before his big crusades, he would often be planning Crusades, I call them, because multitudes of people would come and hear him preach, and then miracles would be all over the place, and the lame would walk, and the blind would see, and, and everyone that was sick or diseased, and every manner of sickness and disease were healed. He was often praying long before those crusades took place. He encouraged and commanded his followers to wait and to pray until they were endued with power from on high in Jerusalem. And they did. But not all of them. About 480 missed the boat. 380. It's 500 who saw him leave that he commanded. 120 of them were there in Jerusalem. So that'd be 380 people. They had other plans. Huh. Well, in Acts 13, the church at Antioch, which would be in modern day Turkey, was a very large city, basically what you call a, a center of commerce, political power of Rome. The Bible says that they gathered there to pray about God's plans. They ministered to the Lord and they fasted. And the Holy Spirit, who? The Holy Spirit, who? The Holy Spirit. What's he come to do? To convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment? He speaks to them. And he tells them, send out Paul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas, for the work whereunto I have called them, past tense. Past tense? Yeah, he'd written it in a book long before they breathed. And now they're praying and seeking God, and he says, send them forth. This is what I've called them to do. So the Bible says that they sent forth Paul and Barnabas for the work that the Holy Spirit had actually called them to do. And how did it happen? Through prayer, worship, fasting. The Lord brought forth the plan of God for Saul and Barnabas. It actually opens our hearts to the work of the Holy Spirit, prayer does. It's why Jesus prayed. It's why he tells us to pray. They were sent forth by the Holy Ghost. Now, here's, here's an interesting fact. Turn to Acts chapter, I think it's chapter 16, where this happens, and we'll read it together. Because you can see not only the plan of God carried out, but how that plan was resisted by Satan himself to stop it from happening. Acts chapter 16. Let's see if I got the right... It's Acts 13, excuse me. Acts 13. And, um, and so they, they're praying together and the Holy Spirit speaks to them and they send them out. They get the plan of God and, and they send Paul and Barnabas out. <clears throat> Disciples are filled with joy. Now, it came to pass, let's see where I'm at. Let's see if I'm looking at the right spot. Uh, beginning at verse, uh, beginning at verse five. And when they were at Salamis, they they had sailed to Cyprus. Cyprus is a large, uh, like an island. It's not an island because it's a big body. Uh, but they were sailed to Cyprus, and then they sailed to the city of Salamis there on Cyprus. And they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. That would be John Mark, whom you remember Paul got mad at later and told him go back to his mama. Verse 6, and when they had gone through the isle of, unto Paphos, Paphos is on the other side of Cyprus, so they come to Cyprus and they, they stop at Salamis, they preach the word of God in a synagogue to Jews. The Bible doesn't say anything that happens there, but the, we, they preach the word of God. What happens when they preach the word of God? Well, the Holy Spirit comes to convince, right? The, following the plan of God. The plan of God gets revealed to them in Acts 13, verse 1. Called them, sent them. This had been written down in a book. Now they preach the word of God. So I'll guarantee the Holy Spirit's convincing of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And uh, then they sail from there and they go to uh, Pophos or Paphos, however you want to say it. Uh, I'm sure there's a right way to say it. I'm not sure what it is. And, uh, and they go there and they preach there. Now watch what happens. When they come to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer there, a false prophet, he's called, a Jew. What? Yeah. His name was Barjesus, or Jesus, Barjesus, which was with the deputy of the country. His name was Sergius Paulus, and he was a prudent man meaning that he thought through about things. And he called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Now here's a man, we don't know if he's over all of Cyprus. It's possible that he is. 
but it's unlikely. The Bible says he's over that country. Could be the country of Cyprus, or it could have been a, like a district. But he's living in Paphos. So they stop at Salamis. They preach the word of God there in a synagogue to Jews. They get back on the boat and sail around the southern side to it, and they come through the isle there of Paphos where the city is located. They get off there, and they run into a Jew who is a sorcerer, a false prophet, they call him. And he has this connection with the deputy or the ruler of the country named Sergius Paulus. And then the Bible calls him a different name. Now watch verse 7. Which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of the Lord. What's going to happen when he hears the word of the Lord? He'll get convinced of sin and of righteousness and just judgment. But Elamus... The sorcerer, for so his name is spoken by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Who is coming to steal and kill and destroy the plan of God over your life? Satan. He wants to keep you out of it. He wanted to keep this Sergio Paulus away from it. Then, verse 9, Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost set his eyes on him. And he said, oh, full of all subtlety. That's the first, second time we see it in the New Testament. This is the first uh, word spoken of as Satan in Genesis 3. The one who is more subtle than all the other creatures. He says, oh, 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 full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of of the Lord. He's coming against sin, not believing in Jesus. He's coming against righteousness, being made right by the blood of Jesus Christ. He's coming against any judgment that's come upon him. He doesn't want him to know that he's been defeated. Oh, full of subtlety and all mischief, child of the devil, enemy of righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him some kind of a mist or a darkness, and he went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And then the deputy, verse 12, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. What was this? God has a plan for you. Satan wants to stop that plan. He wants to steal it from you. But God has already judged him, and Satan has no power. And now darkness will fall upon the very man who's given him power over him, and he will not keep you from the faith of Jesus Christ. Wow. I, I get the sneaky suspicion we should, we should renew our minds a little more, that we should pray about the plan of God in our own lives that's been written in a book before we ever took a breath. The Holy Spirit will convince people to believe in Jesus. He'll convince them that they have been made right by the blood of Jesus Christ. They're no longer guilty. They're no longer under condemnation. He will convince them that Satan has no power over them anymore. He was judged and his power was destroyed at the cross. But you and I are the messengers of this word. The Holy Spirit has actually equipped us and anointed us to carry out his plan in the earth. You and I are his reconcilers. We're called his ambassadors. Remember how I told you Satan comes to steal, kill, or destroy God's plan? So I give a, I give a mandate to my staff last week. I said, you know, I know that you're always sharing your faith, but this week, I'm telling you as your boss, you are mandated by me to go share your faith this week with at least one person. Share your testimony. Tell them about Christ. See if you can even win them to the Lord. Trust the Holy Spirit to convince them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Go find them. We all get busy. We find ourselves distracted. Sometimes we forget to even share our faith. So this week, I want you to do it. You know what was interesting about the result on the next Tuesday when we came back and my staff met? I said, okay, talk to me about what, what happened this week. Every one of us shared about the work of the Holy Spirit guiding us to a person or we knew that we were supposed to speak to that person. And then 
every one of us felt uh, we came up with excuses. Oh, it's a bad time. It's the wrong place. <laughs> you know, what are people going to think? You know, I'm interrupting something. You know, we, we all had these justified excuses. Some of us overcame them. Some of them didn't. And so we all talked about that personally because we are God's ambassadors. And God has a timing in our lives and he's considering you his messenger, his reconciler, his ambassador. The plan for your life is salvation through Jesus Christ, to be made right with God Almighty and to know that you have complete dominion over hell that comes against you. And that plan is to bring that message of Christ to the world, the Holy Spirit working through you to convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. How am I facilitating that plan in my work, in my business, in my day, in my life, in my home, my marriage, my children? How am I following God's plan? And am I praying, getting greater understanding of that plan? Am I renewing my mind to God's word so that, oh, I can see that. That makes sense to me. Never saw that before until I got transformed by what God said. I can possess the land. I am well able for his enemies are bred before me and there is nothing that I fear in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, thank you for the word of the Lord. Thank you that your plans, your purposes are revealed to us, that you have called us. You did those so before we were even born. You had a plan for our life and sometimes we, we just are too busy or we're making our own plans or we're making plans and even asking you to bless them without really searching what your plan is for us. We find ourselves getting dissatisfied, discouraged, many times unfulfilled simply because we're not pursuing the plan of God and our purposes get corrupt, corrupted by man's flesh, by man's plans. I thank you, Father, that you've given each and every one of us a plan in this room. I thank you that you've given this church, this ministry, a plan. And I thank you, God, that we can not only renew our minds to it, but we can pray and discover it revealed to us by the power of the Holy Spirit who convinces us in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for it. Amen. Amen.